Hello everyone, today we're going to be talking about something that a lot of people have probably assumed to be impossible. That being observerless two-way flying machines on Bedrock Edition. Reality is I've actually been using this stuff for quite a while now, though I ended up putting off publishing any of it until now because it was only recently that my mental health would actually allow me to do that. But the underlying problem has been resolved, so today we're going to at least summarize the basics of what I've figured out over the past few years. Of course, what we'll be going over today is not necessarily the only way to do observerless two-way tech on Bedrock. There's almost certainly a lot more potential ways to do it out there. To start off with, all of the flying machines that we're going to see here today all follow a particular pattern of we have an engine on one side, an engine on the other, and then a bunch of just double pushing extensions all the way throughout. Kind of like that, and then we can go back the other way like that. So yeah, that's the main idea. But obviously, we don't want to have these observers. I guess it might be good to start off with the main idea behind an observerless one-way extension. With observers, it's really easy because when they move or detect something, they just pulse. But redstone blocks constantly power stuff. So to get around that, we just place the redstone block on the segment that's being pushed. However, this doesn't really work with sticky pistons as, well, there's nothing powering them. So, one thing we can do though, is we can use another observerless extension to temporarily power it, like so. And that's the main idea behind observerless slimestone. There's plenty more, but that's the main stuff. That brings us to this part right here, which I like to call the S-brace. It's basically just a glorified one-way extension. Except, if we were to go ahead and slide that thing over, now it's a glorified one-way extension, but for the opposite direction. And this will be our main double pushing extension that we'll be using. It may be a little bit limited, but it's quite simple to use. There's not a whole lot of gotchas on how it works. As for the engines, well, we can start with this rather basic one-way flying machine. Uh, yeah, it's just a pulling extension and a pushing extension, so it makes a little caterpillar effect. But if we wanted to push this back, well, first of all, that's an S-brace. So we can just slide that over and start pushing on it. Yeah, and... Oh, well, that's going to be a problem. So when it comes to this engine and basically any other engine that we'll end up using, we also have to turn the engine off in some way, and in this case it's pretty easy, we just slide that one block over, and now we can push it back as much as we want to. From there, it's just a matter of adding the other engine, automating the return stations, and yeah, we have ourselves a basic two-way observerless flying machine. And as you can see, it's able to reverse directions quite easily. However, right now our flying machine is not very useful in that all it does is move back and forth. It doesn't really carry anything with it. And yeah, most of the time we actually want it to carry something. So for that, we're going to need to add some extensions. And fortunately, we can just keep using this S-brace over and over to chain together as many segments as we want. And we get a nice solid six blocks for every segment, because then it's six blocks for the segment, and then another two for the pistons, and then the last four go to the S-brace, as you have to push both the S-brace and the next segment at the same time. Also, in this case, I'm using an alternate stopping mechanism. It's not necessary for this specific case, but I've just included a few different variants so that you can check them out in the world download which as the stuff gets progressively more complex, that's gonna be your main way of knowing how to build this stuff. But either way, yeah, after chaining all this together, as you can see, it is able to fly. And fast forwarding to the end there, as you can see, it's able to return. Now you may have noticed that it has a slight slant to it and that is very much intentional. This makes it so that 
the flying machine can just kind of dock right in. If we were to imagine that this return station were here, then, I mean, this stuff would have been gone, but this as brace would be shifted over and it would just simply pick up that piston and carry it with it and break everything. But by adding a slight amount of staggering to it, that prevents the issue. And if you do want to stagger it like this, you want to make sure that the S braces are slanted in the same direction as the flying machine as a whole. As otherwise, uh, well, it's just not going to work out very well. However, it's not the only way to do it. You can also have them be all nice and in a line here, like so. But in order to prevent the flying machine from breaking the return stations, we'll need to use some honey here so that it just slides right past until it's time to go. And then it just kind of shifts everything all over at the same time. Now, it may seem at first like having it in a nice line and more importantly, shifting everything all at once might be an advantage. But as we'll see later, it's actually not the best. Another way that you can potentially avoid it breaking itself is to use double piston extenders. However, uh, I am admittedly not very good at just about anything related to piston doors, so we're not going to do that one. But either way, that allows us to chain together as many segments as we want, and we get up to six blocks on each segment, which is especially nice because that means we're not actually limited to only one extension per segment. At first glance, it may seem like this is not going to work, it's too many blocks, and indeed, this is 14 blocks, at least if you try to push on it this direction with this configuration. However, you never actually have to push on it in that way. While it's in this configuration, you'll be doing this, which means the part pushing the segment only has to bring one of the S braces with it. And then going back the other way, it's not going to be a problem because, well, there's not multiple S braces touching the same segment anymore, so it all works out. Putting it all together, we can create this sort of tree structure, allowing us to not only have arbitrarily long chains, but we can also have as many of them in parallel as we want. And of course, each segment gets an entire six blocks to work with, making this overall actually quite powerful. And the wild thing is, this is just the simplest form. Oh, right. Yeah, very satisfying to watch. Yeah, that's probably the best part about S-Brace tech is just return station parts tend to get quite satisfying. However, at this point, you've probably also noticed one of the bigger problems with this sort of tech, which is uh, how big it is. Yeah, it requires a huge buildup just to get to the part where we have these four in parallel. But even with that, it's still quite powerful. But let's now talk about one of the biggest uses of a two-way flying machine, that being a sweeper. Here we have kind of your box standard S-Brace powered sweeper. On the bright side, it does indeed function. Uh, however, it does have one obvious downside, that being that it is um, diagonal. However, uh, here the return station is even more satisfying, so that's fun. But yeah, I like to call this the inverted S-Brace because here all of the bulk is on the braces instead of the segments in between. In fact, the segments in between are the absolute bare minimum possible. And yeah, that's pretty much the gist of S braces, which a very simple concept to work with. However, uh, like I said, it can be, it involves a lot of overhead sometimes, but yeah, very simple. But before we get talking about the other kinds of extensions, let's now talk about another topic, reliability. As contrary to what most people would assume, reliability is kind of the one thing that observerless bedrock slimestone really has nailed down, like arguably even more than Java Edition. First of all, let's talk about undesirable updates. This is something that can often break a flying machine. Normally, we would expect that if you move an observer, it only triggers once, as is demonstrated here. However, if you put it underwater, 
it will update twice. And yeah, that can obviously break a lot of things. This same thing can apply to crops growing at the wrong moment. In the case of if you're using a sweeper for a farm. In snowy biomes, it can, well, snow on top of the flying machine, causing observers to get updated. And if you're really unlucky, your flying machine could even get struck by lightning. Um, okay, any moment now? Okay, so observers detect fire aging, just not coming into existence. Cool. However, you have probably already figured out one thing that is in common with all of those scenarios. They involve observers. And we're not using observers. Now, if we were on Java, we would still have to worry about the possibility of budded pistons getting updated. But here on Bedrock, we do not have piston budding, so there's no worry in pistons getting updated at the wrong time. Which means that the simple fact that it only uses redstone blocks automatically makes it immune to all of the things that can cause unwanted updates. So it's waterproof, snowproof, crop proof, lightning proof, all of those things proof. Now speaking of not having piston budding, let's now talk about one thing that these sorts of flying machines can survive that normally can't be survived. And that is crashing into things. As you can see, it has crashed, and normally a flying machine would be quite thoroughly broken at this point. However, in this case, it's just fine. Just due to the simple nature of non buttable pistons, if it crashes into something, it just sits there and waits until the obstacle has been removed. However, sadly, unlike waterproofing, we do not get crash proofing completely for free. We do have to make sure of a few things. Imagine that we had this somewhere in the flying machine. As you can see, it definitely flies. And if this part were to crash into something, then it's going to be fine. So it gets all backed up and then it releases and all is well. However, now imagine that this one got caught on something and then we, you know, it gets backed up. Well, here's the problem. The moment this piston extends, it's going to get left behind, and it's going to break everything. So one of the requirements for making things crash-proof is that you have to make sure that every piston has something behind it, so that if that piston is extended, you won't be able to push the segment forward. The other main thing you have to worry about is making sure that if one branch gets stuck while another does not, it's not going to break anything. So for example, here, everything looks all fine and dandy. However, imagine one of these got stuck and then it crashed into something. Well, now we have a problem. This honey S-brace is grabbing onto this redstone block and therefore pushing this S brace as well, and uh, yeah, it's not going to be able to become unstuck. Even if we turn around, now it's just going to be broken in the opposite way. And one other main thing to keep in mind is while it is possible to include observers in whatever certain ways, it's generally advisable to not have your flying machine do anything based on timing. Branches can get out of sync with each other, but on top of that, when it starts to release, it can often go a little bit faster for a moment. But looking through everything, we can see that this, for example, is crash-proof. It follows all the rules. And so is this one, and this one. Even this one is crash-proof, even if only one of the branches crashes without the others. And this sweeper thing is also crash-proof. So being crash-proof is nice and all, but how is that even useful? Why not just have it, you know, not crash into things? Well, the main reason that that can be useful is actually to deliberately have it crash into things to your advantage. For example, here we have a stepping engine. That is, uh, it moves once every time you give it the signal. 
And yeah, this happens by just having it so that this part only moves when we want it to, and that one little part holds up the entire rest of the flying machine. And uh, yeah, as you can see, it is indeed two directional. If we go one more block, then it's going to reverse directions, and then the rest of it does move for a moment, but then uh, this part still remains still. And another neat thing about this is you can even make it so that it's only a stepping engine going in a single direction. So right then it was fully automatic and now it's actually a stepping engine. Though you may have noticed that this does use observers, but yeah, that's just an example of how honestly one of the best parts about observerless tech is what happens when you add observers back in, just how much more powerful it can become. Speaking of observers and crash proofing and all that, here we have at least an attempt at making a simpler engine involving observers while still keeping it crash proof. I'll admit uh, I'm not the best at this sort of thing, so yeah, there's probably better solutions out there, though this does get into a rather annoying detail. You'll notice that this piston extends every time it gets moved, and that means that in this case we have to wait for a moment so that we can wait for it to finish retracting before you can push the segment over, otherwise the piston will get left behind. But enough about waterproofing and crash proofing, what about the coolest kind of proofing? Relog proofing. Can the flying machine survive when you unload it? Well, that kind of depends on your definition of relog proof. If you're asking whether you can leave the game and come back and it always works, then yes, it's relog proof. If you're asking whether you can leave through another portal or something and then come back through the portal, then yes, it does always survive being unloaded. However, if you're asking whether you can walk away from it and have it always survive, then uh, no, not necessarily. So if you unload and then reload the whole thing both in a single action, then it will always survive. However, uh, if you unload part of the flying machine while the rest of it is still running, well, that doesn't always work out, and that can be especially a big problem once you start throwing on a bunch of extensions, because that means you have a large portion of this that is not running, and a large portion of the that is not, which... Wait, isn't that just crash-proofing? Indeed, crash proofing and perfect relog proofing are very similar concepts. In general, in order to make it perfectly relog proof, you have to account for the fact that any interaction could get delayed by any amount of time at any moment. And a lot of that comes down to crash proofing. However, that's not all. You also have to, for example, make sure that the return stations will always finish. And that's one reason why I really like the staggered version over the move them all at the same time version. Uh, as you can see here, this is in the wrong position. However, the return station is not making any attempt to move it over because this one is in the correct spot. So they must all be in the right spot, right? Meanwhile, with the staggered version, if an S brace is in the wrong state, then the return station will try to push it over. But as I mentioned before, the flying machine as it stands is not perfectly relog proof. However, that is not because of the extensions, that's because of the engines. Remember, any part can get delayed by any amount of time at any moment, so that means that this piston could end up extending and then not retracting, which would require you to cross a chunk border at just the right time, and the chunk border would have to be in a very particular spot, but if that were to happen, as you can see, it is broken, it was not able to pull the piston back. Now granted, it is very easy to fix, and not very likely to happen, but that still means that it is not perfectly relog proof. That's also why I didn't really bother making this part of the return station perfectly relog proof. Uh, as you can see, yeah, there's no guarantee that this piston will actually extend. Ultimately, the problem here just entirely stems from the fact that we're using a push-pull engine. The, it's the pulling part that causes problems, specifically. And that's also why the extensions don't really have any problems. They only use pushing. So in order to make it perfectly relog-proof, we have to use a push-push engine, such as this one. 
as you can see, it only uses pushing. You know, the slime pushes the, the honey, the honey pushes the slime, and yeah. Though, again, the return stations here have to do a bit of some weird stuff to guarantee that they always work. And I don't know why, but in this case, I made the return stations out of slimestone. Yeah, at this point, we're reaching the point of I literally just copied it directly from the world that I found it in. But yeah, this does make it perfectly relog proof, which means that even if you were to add a large number of extensions, it's still guaranteed to survive even if you unload part of it while the rest of it is still running. However, this engine has one obvious downside. It uses the detector rail bug, which while very useful for slimestone, it does also mean that this flying machine only works horizontally, it's not waterproof, and most important of all, there is the possibility that it breaks someday. And that brings us to this monstrosity of an engine with one little extra segment in between, because again, I just copied it directly over for some reason. Uh, but yeah, this one does not use detector rails. However, it is also a push-push engine. Uh, there's one of the pushing, and there's the other pushing. And uh, yeah, that makes it so that it is able to always survive being partially unloaded. Also, this one has a very satisfying return sequence. And again, this time I made all of the return station entirely out of slimestone, which means, in this case, that it works in every possible orientation, and it's waterproof. And one of the best parts is, it only uses the absolute most basic of mechanics, so complex as it may be, uh, not even future updates are likely to break it. In fact, if a future update broke it, we'd probably have much bigger problems on our hands. However, using a push-push engine has one massive downside to it, which is that the timing is not exactly reliable. Here we have uh, three different engines compared, a push-pull engine, a double-push engine, and a triple-push engine. As you can see, the push-pull engine and the triple-push engine are able to stay in sync with each other as they both move at a consistent speed, and it is the same speed. However, the double-push engine does not move at a consistent speed, and unfortunately, it errors on the slower side. However, this timing inconsistency is really more of just a slight annoyance that slows things down, as if your flying machine is going to break due to timing inconsistencies, then that means it's not, you know, perfectly relog proof, and therefore you don't really have any need for either of these engines anyways. And with that, let's now move on to some other two-way observerless extensions, starting with the bird sweeper, as you may call it. I don't know if you want to call it that, but anyways, here we use a pretty basic sort of centering concept, so if it's misaligned, then it'll try to push it into the middle and we just chain that outwards. And the nice thing about this one is, unlike the other sweeper, uh, this one actually extends perfectly straight out, and it also doesn't require any return stations. However, you may have noticed that these pistons don't have anything behind them, and that means it is not crash-proof. Once I release this, all these parts are going to get left behind. However, because it's a sweeper, it's always just going to come right back anyways, which means that it's just going to fix itself. So if it always fixes itself in the end, is it ever truly broken? Of course, the far more useful property here would making it perfectly relog proof, in which case you would need a different engine. Yeah, I just didn't include one of those here because I don't really have one yet that I'm fully satisfied with. Moving on to other things that do not require a return station, we have this snake-like structure, which, yeah, it's able to stretch a long distance without needing any sort of return station. Now, in theory, this thing is crash-proof, however, I have seen it have some trouble with being partially unloaded, as in it just straight up broke after being partially unloaded. So, yeah, I'm not entirely sure there. Next up, we have this one, which does a very similar thing, though it's a bit more compact, 
and it also stretches slightly further per segment. But yeah, as you can see, this main middle part does not need a return station. And once again, at least in theory, this thing is crash proof. However, I have seen it have some problems with partial relogging, at least I think so. That said, if you were to replace this part with a honey structure that looks something like this, then uh, this is absolutely uh, partial relog proof and all of that fun stuff, as it makes sure that these segments won't get too close together. However, each of those length extension things do have one very annoying property in common, which is you can't even add a single extra block to them. However, that is not true for this case, which uses a bunch of T-shapes. The smaller T-shapes, you can add up to seven blocks, and these larger upside down T-shapes, you can add up to three extra blocks. However, unlike the others, it is not even remotely crash proof and therefore very far from being partial relog proof. Moving on, we have a rather odd thing here. This one I like to call the K-brace. Uh, yeah, basically you put an S-brace on one side and then a segment on the other, but you'll notice that this one is a bit extra large. And that's because with the K-brace, it's able to push directly on the segment that you want to push. It also comes with a neat little locking mechanism that makes sure that the segment that it's pushing is never able to push back. And then of course, on top of that, just simply shifting this S piece back and forth makes it reverse directions, which also disables the whole locking mechanism. One other neat detail about the K-brace is that so long as you keep full sights in this state, you can, instead of moving the S shape back and forth, you can instead move the segment that it's pushing back and forth, and that will work just fine. However, one annoying downside is that it can introduce some slight timing inconsistencies, and as it turns out, a K-brace is actually used in this Omniproof engine, I guess that's a name you could give this sort of thing. But yeah, there's a K-brace right here, and that's just so that we can push on a larger engine. Almost forgot to include this one. Here we have just one example of how you can create a direct horizontal array of S-braces. And uh, yeah, uh, one downside is it is not even remotely crash-proof. Uh, I do have a crash-proof variant somewhere, however, uh, it's like gigantic. It involves a K-brace on both sides, so it has something like this, then K-brace, S-brace, K-brace, and then this. So yeah, it's quite a lot. I did not include it in here because I did not want to copy it over. I'm too lazy. And then, last but not least, that brings us to this extension method that I discovered actually just this past week. Somehow it took me until now to realize this. But yeah, it's basically just a pair of interlocking one-way extensions, so that sliding this part back and forth makes it so that only one of them is active at a time. And yeah, here we see it in action. And also, once again, we do have to wait for it to finish extending and retracting the piston before moving the segment over, which is annoying, especially for making it partial unload proof because it is just so difficult to account for that. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much the main idea behind a lot of the observerless two-way tech that I've discovered. There's still plenty more to be discovered, like especially with engines. It'd be nice to have an engine that is perfectly relog proof, but also maybe triple push, honeyless, or more compact, maybe a combination of those, who knows? And more extension-based tech is being found all the time. As I mentioned earlier, I found this method just last week. Now, before we go, I have some excitement to share. For those who don't know, some of my videos have an extra special Easter egg called the Golden Egg. And I'd like to give a shout out to Apaya46 for being the first one to find one of them. But if you are familiar with producer ticks and consumer ticks, that is actually a simplified model that does not properly explain observers. This is a reference to the two main models of gravity. Newtonian gravity is the much simpler and generally sufficient one. However, some things such as the shape of Mercury's orbit can only be explained by the more complete, but also much more complicated, 
general relativity. And funnily enough, even though it's not always the case, today's golden egg is also an academic reference, though you could argue that it's not technically specific to this video, but anyways, world download is in the description. Thank you for watching, and most important of all, trans rights are human rights.